adversity is the mother of opportunity. And carrying this motto forward, we at the Dharma Shastra National Law University, Jabalpur, are also embarking on this initiative of trying to remain connected and associated with our students through the means of internet. As part of this endeavor, we, we at DNLU Jabalpur have started this initiative of uh, recording uh, the talk and lectures of and the teachers uh, so that and, and delivering it to the students so that the academic loss during this period of uh, outbreak of coronavirus of our students can be minimized. Continuing this exercise forward, uh, since I've been given the responsibility uh, to discuss the syllabus of jurisprudence with the students here, I would start with the fourth module of the syllabus of jurisprudence, which is about American realism. If you remember students, uh, in my initial classes, I have discussed the central theme of American realism movement, wherein I told you that according to this school of law, law is what the judge says. Now, though I'm calling it school of law, but uh, the protagonists, especially the ones who started this movement, were of this view that uh, this is not a school of law since uh, they argued that we do not have a conception of our own about, uh, about law. We are only stating the reality. And the reality is that uh, much of what is contained in the black letter law is incapable of producing certainty. And therefore, it is eventually what comes out from the courtroom in the form of its authoritative interpretation that counts as law. And, uh, and therefore, law is what the judge says. Now, in this uh, fourth module of our syllabus, which is about American realism, we'll uh, try to look into the different nuances of this central theme uh, that law is what the judge says. Now, uh, moving on to uh, the next slide. American realism is a reaction against positivism. We have seen that uh, several schools have actually originated in response to uh, another school of thought and uh, American realism is also no different. Now, what was the claim of positivism? Positivism's claim was that certainty in law is achieved by having laws in black and white. In fact, this was the central argument of positivism against natural law, that insistence on natural law uh, makes the content of law ambiguous and therefore with a view to bring about certainty of law, positivism emphasized upon uh, the black letter law being treated as law, so therefore the form becomes the determining attribute of what the law is. Contradicting this argument of positivism, American realists argue that certainty in law is a myth, regardless of the fact that you have laws codified in the form of black and white law by the legislature. Because they argued that however precisely law may be drafted, it is eventually what comes out from the courtroom is what determines for us the law. Now, what is meant by this? Now, if we go into the argument, we would realize that what is being actually stated is that any black letter law until unless it is actually to be operationalized, it is simply a law confined to paper. And American realists argue that the law comes into operation only when the law is to be applied by judges in a courtroom, in a real life scenario. And they argue that when it comes to application of law in the courtroom to real life cases, we find that certainty which is so vociferously claimed by the positivists to have been achieved merely by having laws in black and white is actually of very little help to the judges when they are 
applying the same to a real case. Realists argue that uh, any given proposition of law can be used on a real case to decide the case either way. Now, if we move on to the next slide, So continuing the discussion forward, wherein uh, I was talking about the fact that uh, that American realists would argue that any given case can be decided either way. Uh, you would find this uh, famous uh, quote by one of the leading protagonists of the American realist movement, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes of the United States Supreme Court who while speaking in a conference argued that general propositions do not determine concrete cases. I always say in conferences that no case can be settled by general propositions, that I will admit any general proposition you like and decide the case either way. Now, this is a very candid admission by a judge uh, about the fact that when he or she is actually adjudicating a dispute, probably both uh, sides' arguments can actually be accepted by him or her in a manner so as to uh, make it the most plausible uh, explanation of uh, his or her judgment. What this tells us, now this precisely uh, tells us what American realists are actually arguing, that had certainty been achieved by having laws in black and white, this possibility of every case possibly uh, which comes out before the courtroom uh, be decided in either way would not have been there. And as, as law students, we also know that every case which comes before the courtroom, you would find that the two set of lawyers would come to the court arguing their respective cases against each other. Now, this definitely happens because of this belief which is there among the advocates from both sides that there is a possibility of uh, of law being on their side and why this happens when the law is same why should there be a possibility of the same uh, being interpreted so as to suit the outcome of uh, either side this should not happen if if law is something uh, which is capable of producing certainty by having uh, by by having it in black in black and white law now once you realize and once you acknowledge this fact you should definitely appreciate what the american realists are actually trying to insist upon they are saying that that you you will not be able to achieve certainty merely by having laws in black and white and it's actually the case in n number of cases you would find that uh, that the on same set of facts same same laws the lower court would say one thing the high court would say another and the supreme court would eventually disagree with both the lower court and the high, higher court in terms of the outcome of the case for example if i take this infamous case of Pradarshini mattu uh, which is uh, a case of an case of a uh, of law student studying in, uh, in 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 Delhi University, being raped and murdered by one of her seniors, also studying in the same uh, faculty of law, Delhi University. Now, in this case, uh, the lower court uh, acquitted the accused, and on the same facts and law, the High Court of Delhi convicted the accused and sentenced him to death penalty. When the matter went in appeal before the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court affirmed the conviction, but the court altered the sentence from death penalty to life imprisonment. Now, this very clearly tells you that, that there is a huge element of subjective reading of the black letter law involved in the exercise of adjudication. And American realists are primarily trying to highlight this fact. They are not, they are not arguing 
that law should not be codified in black and white but what they are arguing is the fact that we should not be uh, trying to convince ourselves by saying that merely because laws have been codified in, in, in a statute, certainty in law has been achieved and that we need to remain conscious of the fact that despite the fact that we have laws in black and white, much of how it is read would depend upon how the judge before whom the law will come for application is eventually going to apply and read it. And this is a very, very important uh, uh, important point highlighted by the American realists. As you can see in contemporary times also, like this recent, uh, very recent controversy of uh, the former Chief Justice of India, Chief Justice, uh, Ta, uh, Chief Justice Gogoi, uh, Ranjan Gogoi, uh, accepting the nomination of uh, Rajya Sabha uh, by the President of India as a as a person who has uh, achieved uh, distinction in his life, which is a constitutional provision in our in our constitution whereby the president can nominate uh, such persons of distinguished merit to Rajya Sabha. Now, it has not, uh, Justice Gogoi has uh, not even completed six months uh, as a retired judge of the Supreme Court and uh, he has agreed to take up this nomination coming from the government. This has sparked uh, a huge debate as to uh, as to whether a judge should actually accept it, accept such nominations or not. But as a student of jurisprudence, especially a student who is studying American realism, this present controversy is a very important uh, uh, point to pause and understand as to what this controversy is about. Is it is it the controversy that uh, uh, that that probably uh, that Go Justice Gogoi should have interpreted the law as it is? and that he has actually tweaked the law to as, as to suit uh, the present government and therefore in return of what he actually gave the government he is getting this reward this probably is an exaggeration this is not what this controversy is about this controversy is is is, is more about um, uh, some of the fundamental ethics of judicial life which is that uh, that judges must always maintain a strict separation between uh, between uh, between judiciary vis-a-vis -vis legislature and executive however it also presents us uh, with an important uh, question for our understanding which is that uh, whether uh, a judge who is supposed to be not close to the executive or close to the government is supposed to interpret it as it is now the moment you say that a judge is supposed to interpret the law as it is you are insisting upon the fact that there is an amoral version of uh, of reading of the law in question possible i am insisting upon the fact that you are saying that if you say that the judge should have read the law as it is and it, the judge should not have read the law or applied the law so as to suit the government you are actually insisting upon the fact that for every case which comes up before the court there is a possibility of an amoral reading uh, of the law and the judge should always prefer that amoral path of reading the law now, when you say this amoral path of reading the law, what you are actually saying is that law is, there's no moral reading possible of the law. Now, when you say there's no moral reading possible of the law, what is it that you're saying? You're actually endorsing the point of view of positivist. That is, that because of the fact that you have laws existing in the form of black and white, you simply have to read it as it is, whereas the fact remains that much of what you say the existing law uh, still remains to be interpreted in the light of the facts and this reading 
invariably involves reading uh, law morally and therefore this argument of law being read in an amoral way perhaps is inappropriate so therefore if you again go back to this uh, ranjan gogoi controversy people who are trying to link his appointment with uh, the possible judicial verdicts which uh, he has rendered uh, Uh, which which suits the ideological narrative of the of the central government they are actually what they are actually saying they are saying that uh, he interpreted the law so as to suit the ideological narrative of the government now this is one very clear admission of uh, the central argument of american realism that it is always in the hands of judges to read what the existing law is regardless of the fact that the judge is actually called upon to interpret and apply an existing black letter law but what we what we must also understand is that though this is an acknowledgement of the fact that adjudication involves interpreting law which cannot be isolated from Uh, the moral reading of the law a uh, reading wherein you are supposed to travel into the realm of art but at the same time this must not be confused with this argument that adjudication therefore necessarily is an amoral exercise an exercise which is which cannot be an exercise in the realm of uh, a priori reasoning it adjudication what is being argued by american realist is that adjudication remains an exercise in the realm of uh, a priori reasoning adjudication remains an exercise in the realm of uh, art however if you look at adjudication through the prism of uh, positivism adjudication is an exercise in the realm of is and that that is that is a very important point that we need to understand uh, that for, for 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 a formal legal system adjudication would always remain an exercise in the realm of is but american realists are actually trying to tell us that this is an eye wash american real that american realists are telling us this very important vital point that it is just for the sake of uh, uh, adjudication fitting into a theoretical uh, narrative of our legal system the reality is that adjudication actually is an exercise in the realm of art it involves a priori reasoning and therefore since it involves uh, reliance on a priori reasoning venturing into the realm of art law eventually is what comes out from the from the courtroom because only after this application of a priori reasoning is done that we are in a position to know the outcome of a case and therefore the argument that the law eventually is what comes out from the courtroom one uh, another important point that i are actually trying to emphasize upon is that we must always look at a uh, reality which is that law in action and law in action is when law is operationalized and law is operation operationalized according to realist when the law is to be applied by the judges in the court room and that is one very very important point that we need to take home while studying this american realism movement moving on moving on now if you read the central claim of uh, american realists which is that law is what the judge says Uh, it seems as if uh, american realists are actually saying that uh, it is the judicial precedents which are far more important than the law made by the legislature however uh, this is not what the american realists are saying and that makes it slightly complicated if law is what the judge says uh, how it is different from Uh, judicial precedents which we the law students know uh, as the judge made law now here you have to understand the meaning of uh, 
of uh, law made now when you study uh, constitutional law you are being told that judges are not supposed to make law and yet while studying the same constitution of india you come across a provision like article 141 wherein you are told that a decision given by by the supreme court is binding on all the courts and if you read the commentary of article 141 of the constitution you are told that the interpretation given of the existing black letter law is what actually counts as the binding judicial precedent under article 141 and you are also told that this uh, judicial precedent uh, is not something which is to be considered as uh, as violation of the doctrine of separation of power which says that the law cannot be made by the judges so therefore it is important to understand uh, the distinction between uh, law made and the law found the actual understanding of article 141 is wherein you say that 141 is not contrary to the doctrine of separation of power is that under article 141 by way of a judicial precedent it is being said that the judges are only finding law and that judges are not making law and therefore even though judicial precedent is law it is law not because of the fact that it has been made by the judge it is law because of the fact that it has been found by the judge now what is the difference now, the difference again lies in the theoretical edifice of how we construe adjudication if you look carefully at the nomenclature used in, in article 141 of the constitution uh, the provision says law declared by the supreme court now this is a very careful choice of word law declared in law you declare what already exists and therefore the understanding is that though judicial precedent is emanating from article 141 in the form of supreme court judgments what is important to understand is that by way of these interpretations supreme court is not making law supreme court is only declaring the existing law and therefore this declaration of the existing law is something which falls within the accepted norms of what is permissible in the exercise of adjudication and therefore it is not considered to be contrary to separation of power which insists upon uh, judges not being involved in law making now come to what uh, american realists are arguing american realists are arguing that this theoretical understanding of judges only declaring the existing law is actually a myth they are saying that this is the, the that this exercise of adjudication is not limited to merely declaring the existing law by way of finding it judges for all practical purposes by way of interpreting law are actually making law and therefore they refuse to accept this uh, this this artificial distinction uh, of judges being only involved in an exercise of uh, finding law by way of declaration and it is precisely because of this reason that it is wrong to attribute uh, to american realists the claim that american realists actually insist on giving prominence to judicial precedents in fact in fact if you really understand American realist argument, you would understand that for an American realist, a uh, judicial precedent is also nothing but a black letter law. And uh, the central argument of American realist is that the black letter law does not produce certainty. And, and, and if, uh, if a ratio decision die of a judgment, which is what counts as the judicial precedent, uh, is to be taken as the black letter law then according to american realism even that ratio decedent die does not produce certainty because eventually for all future references that ratio is nothing but 
a black letter law and therefore the same logic would apply <clears throat> and and as a cost consequence despite the fact that you have a binding judicial precedent in subsequent cases the same binding judicial precedent will again be susceptible to contrary interpretations and this is this precisely is the point american religious are trying to make and therefore there is a very important distinction between what american realists say and what we understand as uh, as 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 the as the concept of binding judicial precedent the two are not at all same in fact for american realists a binding judicial precedent is nothing but a black letter law which does not produce certainty so when they are saying that law is what the judge says they are not endorsing uh the common law concept of binding judicial precedent and that uh, should be very clear to us uh in order to put the same thing in a in a in a in a in a very beautiful way uh you need to look into uh, an important statement of uh, another former judge of the US Supreme Court justice cardozo uh which we'll see in our next slide so as i said uh, that in order to better understand uh, the distinction between uh, what american realists argue and what the concept of binding judicial precedent is uh, you need to look into this statement of justice ben benjamin cardozo uh, who once said that law is never is it is always about to be it is realized when embodied in a judgment and in being realized expires now what does that mean he is saying law is never is now law is never is uh, the first is in this is a grammatical is and the second is is a factual is the concept of is and not that we are familiar with so he is saying law is never is so what he is saying is that there is no is law then he says it is always about to be every law is always an about to be law there is no is law so what he is actually trying to insist upon is that fact that there is no existing law as such law is always in the making and it is never is then he says that it is realized so he is acknowledging the fact that this about to be possibly for a moment is realized when the same is embodied in a judgment but the moment judgment comes out he says he says that it expires and it is realized when embodied in a judgment and in being realized expires so the moment uh, this about to be becomes is when it is when a judgment is pronounced it again becomes about to be now what does that mean now what he is trying to tell us is again what american realists are actually arguing they are saying that this black letter law is nothing but a law about to be and this law about to be comes out in the form of is when a judgment is pronounced but the moment that judgment is pronounced again that judgment also becomes the law about to be now how why that judgment also becomes the law about to be because the judgment for all future references will only be counted as law because of its precedential value and as we have seen in the in the last slide that binding judicial precedent is also nothing but a black letter law for american realists and therefore when you say the statutory law is law about to be there is no difference between statutory law and a judicial precedent so both would count as uh, law about to be and uh, in this statement though there is one important point that is law possibly then is is for the parties to the case because the that law would bind the parties so when it comes to the real is it is only that is which binds the parties is what the is law is and for that only justice cardozo is saying it is realized when embodied in a judgment 
and in being realized expires it expires for all future purposes but it is an is law so far as its effect on the parties is concerned so this again very beautifully explains the distinction between what american realists argue as law uh, being the product of uh, of of judicial articulation but at the same time uh, they are not endorsing the common law principle of judicial precedent so uh, with this i conclude uh, my today's talk in my next talk i will continue uh, this exercise of trying to understand the different nuances of uh, american realism forward <clears throat> Thank you very much for your patient listening. Bye-bye.